There is so much diversity of life on our planet, from our insects, wildlife and plants, to the billions of microorganisms in our water, in the soil and in the very air we breathe. In a fast-changing world, our ecosystems and the biological diversity in them are coming under increasing pressure. So why is our natural biodiversity so important to us? And why should we care about it? Biodiversity is not separate from us. We as humans are a part of this intricate web of life. As naturalist John Muir said, when one tugs at a single thing in nature, he finds it attached to the rest of the world. So Jane, what do we mean by biodiversity? Well, biodiversity is a term that encompasses all the diversity of life on Earth. We're talking about variation and diversity uh, within a species, so the genetic variation that causes each individual to be different, um, but the variation between species as well, so all the different species of plants and animal and microorganisms that we have, as well as the variation of the diversity of different habitats. Biodiversity, it's absolutely vital to us because it provides the food we eat, it provides a lot of the services we need, like clean water, clean air. It provides us wood that we use for our houses. It provides fibre that we have for our clothes. It's everything. This biodiversity that we depend on is the product of four billion years of evolution all of these life forms and their ecosystems interacting and relating with each other. Although so much has been lost around the world in a relatively short time, in Ireland we still have some species-rich ecosystems and habitats. Our coastal and marine habitats, wetlands, peatlands and our woodlands and even a simple meadow of wild flowers such as this, rooted in a healthy soil, supports a whole range of ecosystems in which insect populations will make their homes. We've over 12,000 species of insects in Ireland. And when I tell people that, they always marvel. So we really, you know, we have a, hardly have a handle on exactly what we have. But there's over 2,000 species of beetles and 3,000 species of wasps and 3,000 species of flies as well. So here in this site, you'd probably get you know, up to 1,000 different species of insects living here. So with all of these species we've got in Ireland, you know, what are the benefits that we as humans can get from them? Insects provide a huge number of of ecosystem services is what they're called. Pollination being the big ones. Um, another thing is it's nutrient recycling and another is pest control. So these are free services that insects provide for us here. Bees are the main pollinators. You also get moths pollinating and beetles. Anything that go and feed on pollen on flower heads can be pollinators. But the most effective pollinators are bees. Things like apples and strawberries and potatoes are all pollinated by bees. And are there certain sorts of flowers that they like more than others? Um, there are, but really it's variety is the important thing. So looking around here and seeing there's a huge variety of plants and flowers and that's the best thing for insect diversity. So what are the main pressures on biodiversity and especially on insects? One of the main pressures is intensive agriculture. Pesticides will wipe out the insects completely and uh, the same, you know, herbicides have a huge impact as well. On well, an intense farm, a farmer will be ploughing a field, reseeding with one species of grass, but then that's just a monoculture and you'll get very little insect diversity there, as opposed to something like this that's never been reseeded, never been fertilised, and has got hundreds of different types of plants in it. That's a much more valuable habitat for insects. Just as biodiversity in the insect world is reliant on species-rich grasses, 
on flowers and trees. These in turn are dependent on healthy soil biodiversity, a whole hidden world that exists beneath our feet. So what sort of species would exist in this soil? You'd have a huge variety of species present in this soil. Just in one teaspoon of soil, we have over a billion bacteria present. There's actually more bacterial species in a teaspoon of soil than we have animals found in the Amazon rainforest. So what sort of species will you find in the soil here? Of course we have the bacteria and the fungi themselves, so they're two distinct groups. And then we also have the invertebrates that live in the soil. So what sort of functions do these species perform? When you're looking at bacteria and the fungi, they have very, very localised effects upon soil processes. And then when you get to the bigger fellas, like um, the earthworms, one that's just hidden there, they are called the ecosystem engineers and they're involved in actually moving the soil um, particles themselves and restructuring them. And they manage a lot of the physical processes that are going on. Rachel and her team are conducting research on different soil types and the invertebrates present are crucial to understanding soil biology. The soil is a whole sort of ecosystem in its own right and there are huge communities as we would have in the normal human population that interact with each other, that feed upon each other, predate upon each other, that work in symbiosis with each other. What they do is they provide um, the flow of chemicals through the soil. They also provide, um, develop the physical structures within the soil to air aeration and drainage. They provide nutrients to the plants that grow above ground. And they also help contribute to cleaning water that passes through the soil before it hits the river networks. So it's quite incredible when we think about how important we preserve our rainforests, which are very important, and our ecosystems above ground, but actually we have such a diverse network of species living beneath ground, so we have to consider those as well. Urban sprawl and habitat fragmentation, pollution and intensive agriculture have each had their own detrimental effects on soil biodiversity. However, the impact of changes in farming methods in the last 50 years are only beginning to be understood and are far-reaching. I was studying organic agriculture in America, where I'm from, and when I learned about the loss of diversity of, of seeds, that, that most seeds had become hybridized, at that point genetic modification wasn't really on the scene, and that the true open-pollinated varieties of seed that can be cropped year from year were almost gone. And it really struck me, really, to my core because I was a gardener and I love gardening, I love growing food, and I couldn't imagine how I didn't know that. Inspired by the work of a non-government gene bank called the Seed Savers in the US, Anita decided to establish something similar in Ireland, working with Dr. Keith Lamb to collect hundreds of native varieties of apples, and expanding from there to become what is now Irish Seed Savers. There was very little work that the government did on Irish, conserving Irish vegetable varieties or grain varieties. So before the potato, Irish people, you know, were healthy from oats, barley, flax, and there was no formal collection of those varieties. So we had to actually go to the Vavilov Institute in Russia, which is now under threat of destruction. And they had conserved Irish grain varieties. So it was from there that we were able to repatriate little tiny bunches of them and a farmer in Kilkenny grew them out. Um, I actually have some. With really? Yeah. These are now Northern. grain from what type of? This is an oat, oat grain. oats. Irish oat this, grain. Irish oat grain. This is, this is a variety that's very good for thatching. Can't buy that Irish thatch anymore. Of course, very absolutely, difficult. I know. Yeah. Do we lose an awful lot of species here in Ireland, or varieties of species? Yeah. Agricultural diversity all over the world has had a massive loss since the 50s. The UN estimated that in some areas in the West, 90% of agricultural biodiversity has been lost, and the same holds for here. So, I mean, if somebody had done the work we did 40 years ago, it would probably be quite a different story. So we focus on the production of open pollinated varieties wherever we get them from 
if they work in Ireland, if people can use them in their gardens to grow a good crop. Because open pollinated varieties are very precious because most vegetable varieties you buy are F1 hybrids. Those are only produced, you can only get seed from them one year, which means the gardener has to buy the seed every year. My favorite brassica is um, the Delaware cabbage, which we got from under the bed of 80-year-old Mr. Hughes in Mayo, who had grown it all his working life for his family. And was that nearly extinct? Well, it was. It was just under his bed. <laughs> Wait, that was the last <laughs> of it? That was the last of it, yeah, and really? his daughter gave it to us. Anita's story reminds us that so much has happened in the last 50 years to transform the way we live. And these changes have also had a dramatic impact on our biodiversity. We have lost a lot, there's no doubt about that, over the last sort of 30, 40 years, particularly as we intensified everything we did since the 1950s and 60s. All of the loss of biodiversity has been driven by human activities. So intensification of agriculture, building of houses, draining of wetlands, introduction of invasive species, pollution, unsustainable exploitation of natural resources. All these kind of things are causing loss of species and loss of habitats. So what about our forests and native woodlands? Well, of course, we have very little left because they were cut down here. You know, what's going on in, in a lot of the tropical rainforest areas where we're really concerned about the forest disappearing, that happened here already. So the little scraps that we have left, and I'm afraid that's really all we have, they're very important in an Irish context because we only have one or two percent of the country with semi-natural woodland, as we call it. It's all affected by our activities in some way or another. And then, in the longer term, climate change is something that we're concerned about. We already see it affecting some species, and we know that that is going to be a problem over the next 50 to 100 years. We're seeing species moving northwards within the country, species a mountain specialist becoming extinct in Ireland, and then other species coming in from Europe and uh, starting to establish along the south coast of Ireland, and that's all in relation to the change in temperatures. That's fine, species moving northwards, but the problem is that the habitat needs to be there for them as well. So the worry is that we don't have a good network of, of sites like this, where insects can hop and move from one to the other. The wildflower meadows Eugenie had taken me to as prime example of an insect habitat is on a farm owned by farmer Michael Bow, who had 100 acres of land designated under the EU Habitats Directive as a special area of conservation. It's unique in a way in that it's never been touched with fertiliser. I've never done anything to it. I've just left it as it is. For me, I use it as winter grazing, end of story. And, and is it good for grazing like that? I mean, how do the cattle it, like it now, for example? Yeah, it's great. It's, it's great. It's excellent, actually. I've had animals who, who don't thrive in, in other areas, such as areas which were fertilised or fertilised and more intensively farmed. And then when they come over here for the summer, they turn inside out. Does all this variety of different herbs and different plants here, is that good for their diet? It is, Duncan, and there's one particular area at, at the back of the hill, it's about 10 acres of level ground, which I actually baled hay in it yesterday, and the, the smell from the hay, it's, it's all pasture, again, that was never fertilised or anything like that, so, I mean, you'd probably call it organic hay, but the smell was actually like sweet tea, that's the only thing I compare, compare it to. And, I mean, if I were to give the animals, be it horses or cattle or cows, uh, their choice of, uh, of your traditional fertilised reseeded hay and this old pasture hay. They'd all automatically go for the old pasture hay without any shadow of a doubt. With so much pressure on our natural biodiversity, the rare sight of wildflower meadows and small patches of native woodland dotted around the country is a reminder that our few remaining habitats are precious. Amongst these are ancient wooded pathways on ridges of land known as eskers, remnants of the last ice age. You think about like kind of a big, big ice sheet over us and as that kind of was retreating back, you had these tunnels of almost like rivers underneath the ice flowing and as, they start, as the meltwater started to move back it was leaving these kind of layers of sand and gravel and cobbles like a river bed but kind of upside down and underneath the ice sheet where you can kind of see that there's evidence of how it's a water lane deposit like with lovely little waves I see the in waves the sand. really yeah so yeah. that's from that's from the ice as it moved over and the water 
the trickling underneath. Of the water. And then because it's up in a ridge, it wouldn't be managed so much. So you have farms on either side of the ridges and the ridges themselves are kind of less intensively managed. Because they're less accessible, really. Yeah. So Pretty they've much. survived. Yeah. So now, Duncan, and if you think about what we were talking about, the geology with the fine sand, here's an example of where an animal has actually exploited the geology to make its home because you have the sets of the badger dug right into the really, really kind of Three fine of them sand. here. Three of them here. And they're running out of the set here and back up into the woodland, crossing this agricultural field. They've got lots and lots of paths running through the esker and you can see that very, very clearly when you go into the woodland. This esker is a habitat that provides sanctuary for all sorts of wildlife, much like our own network of hedgerows spread across the countryside. As we were talking about the, the badgers here, like badgers and fox and stoat, they're all going to move along hedgerows as well. They're safe places, I suppose they're protected. If you think about bats flying at night time as well, often they'll fly along hedgerows so they're not out in the open. And bats, just as much as we do, read the landscape and they're following the lines of the hedgerows like roads. So hedgerows, in a way, can act as sort of roads through the landscape for lots of different wildlife. The hedgerows have become, if you like, our secondary woodlands and they are really important around the country. We still have a great length of them. And it's great that a lot of measures have been put, put in place and I think farmers and, and the agricultural community really do understand the value of our hedgerows as the next best thing in, as, that we have to widespread woodlands in the country. Local communities can also create spaces for wildlife and biodiversity. And at Glinsk Heritage Park in County Galway, they're hosting a biodiversity day where birdwatcher Tom Cuff is taking people on field trips. Here right now you actually see that there's a couple of birds flitting around there, they're actually small, probably tits, and you're probably looking at a cold tit and okay. a, probably a right, blue tit. Okay. This winter time you're going to get your, your native Irish species that are true to Ireland, and there's a little pond up the road there, and there's um, the coots and the moorhens. And are so they all plentiful here in wildlife? They all seem to be plentiful, they all seem to be doing well, you know what I mean, which is a sign that the, that the habitat is right that the people in the area are doing something good. It's also possible to create a habitat in your own backyard, as Kay Sennett demonstrates by building what she calls a bug hotel, a safe place for insects to live in the garden. So what should we grow in a garden to attract wildlife? The buzzword for many years was low maintenance gardens, which basically means a garden that consists usually of hard landscaping and maybe a bit of lawn and, and a few token shrubs. But if we think more of, of natural gardens, if it's a case of planting as many different types of species of trees and bushes and shrubs and flowers in the garden that would attract wildlife because a lot of insects are very specialised in what, what food plants they use and what they can feed on to survive. And dead wood, now is that important in your garden too, to keep some dead wood? Absolutely, we really have to make some more room for decay. We tend to be over tidy in our gardens. And it's a much better idea to have spaces where you can let them rot down naturally. And that will again encourage uh, insects in. So if you're in a suburban garden and you've got lots of neighbours around you, how do you encourage more wildlife into our gardens? Well, suburban gardens are a great example because Suburban gardens together, collectively, they make a new, whole new habitat. So if all the neighbours, of all the people got together and had a little bit of a think about what would be useful plants to plant, that would make a huge difference. There are measures in place to protect and restore habitats for wildlife. But what is the reality outside of these designated protected areas? Have you seen a big difference from when you started all of this? Oh yeah, it's serious. Like even, say, the simple blackbird. Um, that you see in your back garden. They've actually gone down in numbers. Even there's actually a fear right now, the common house sparrow is, is uh, disappearing. In Europe, um, they're, they're, they're disappearing at a phenomenal rate. And it doesn't look good for Ireland, for the corn crake. Now it's our most endangered species. We reckon at the moment we've only got about 130 left in Ireland. 130 from 20,000 birds almost 25 years ago. 
A lot of species that are associated with the old-fashioned farming systems that have largely disappeared, they, they're in trouble just because we do things differently. So, I mean, you know, birds like the corncrake, for example, that depended on a slow pace of life where we, we grew our meadows and then over the course of the summer hay was cut slowly so that they had a chance to escape. You know, we know that they're in trouble. Uh, the corn bunting, any, in fact any plant or animal that has the word corn in its name probably is in trouble because they come from a time in the past when agriculture was much more light touch. It's not only our terrestrial flora and fauna that's under pressure. The overexploitation of our seas is sadly becoming a familiar story. Overfishing has depleted our fish stocks, often to irreversible levels, and caused damage to marine habitats. A prime example is the story of the oyster. In the last year, we grew 7,000 tonnes of oysters, most of those the introduced, farmed Japanese oyster. In the port of Arklo in the 1850s, they exported something more than 20,000 tonnes in one year. I don't think that was sustainable, but it was due to the fact that we once had an oyster bed that ran from Dublin down to Wexford. Can you imagine it? Dublin to Exford. It was so rich that boats came from Brittany to harvest those oysters. I don't think there's an oyster left. The whole ecosystem, 90 to 100 miles long, just gone. So not only have we lost a valuable food source, but also a free ecosystem service the oyster provided. Every oyster can filter one to two litres an hour. If you had millions of oysters all filtering, I mean, we spend millions upon millions now trying to clean our water. We had a natural system for doing it. A UN study on the economics of ecosystems and biodiversity has compiled a compelling case. The recent study evaluated the loss of our natural capital at trillions of dollars. This is for the free benefits provided by ecosystem services such as clean air, fertile soil and pure water. Keeping track of what we're losing and what we've already lost is a huge task. This is why the International Union for Conservation of Nature was established. Their red list of threatened species underlines the extinction crisis as every day plant and animal species are being lost at up to 1,000 times the natural rate. That's faster than at any time in the biological history of this planet. And most of these extinctions are tied to human activity. The danger is that this is likely to be a glimpse of the future for many of our species. But looking at the bigger picture, what have scientists who work in this field found to be at stake when it comes to global biodiversity loss? It's been equated with the rate of species loss that occurred during the last big mass extinction, which is when the dinosaurs went extinct. So we are losing species at a rapid rate. They say if insects were to disappear, we would have, you know, months. Um, on this planet. So we really, really are interdependent on the services that insects provide. And our ecosystem is so delicate, it's really this kind of web of life. And the insects provide a really fundamental part of that. We, we can't do enough in making people understand the importance of our biodiversity. What it does for us, there's an economic value, uh, there's a cultural value, there's an aesthetic value. Um, and we have an obligation to pass this on to future generations. Biodiversity is the basis of life. It provides the air we breathe, the water we drink, and the food we eat. It's a rich tapestry of life of which we are just a part. And right now, we've a lot to lose. In our next episode of EcoEye, we'll see why communities like Clannacilty and Ockram in County Wicklow are taking their first step towards reinventing their future. We'll investigate the quality of the air we breathe, 
and explore one of Ireland's natural frontiers.